Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, this is my first talk I'm on insurance, so ho hopefully it goes well and appreciate you coming to listen. I know it's not the most exciting topic, but something that is I don't think a lot of people have a good understanding of and, and it's very important, I think, playing out in your career. Um, so I'll talk a bit about myself. I was going to talk a bit about very high level about what different products are available and what people um, look for in, in different mining insurance. And then as an insurance broker, what do we do and how does that fit into the mining world? And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about McGriff as well, which is the company I work for and, and why you want to work with, why I recommend working with an insurance broker. So yeah, as, um, as during the intro, as you said, I, I graduated from School of Mines twice in uh, 2005 with a uh, bachelor's in mining engineering. Uh, and then in 2006 with the master's in economics, uh, right when he was starting here and took, took a class with him during my grad school year. Also was very honored to be in 2015 by the CSM Alumni Association named the Outstanding Young Alumnus Award in, in 2015, which was, was great to be awarded. Right out of school, I don't like the camera, I like to walk around. <laughs> Right out of school, I worked for an engineering company, Marston and Marston, which no longer exists. They were bought by Vulcan, sorry, not by Vulcan, by Golder Associates a number of years ago, but did a lot of pure engineering work. Uh, most of the work I did was for the Colorado mine, which is outside of Craig, the coal mine at the time was owned by uh, Rio Tinto. Since now, I think it's owned by Tri-State, but did work for uh, one of their new pits that they were developing. And, basically put together a feasibility study for that. And I think what was exciting about that project is they actually mined it. I think a lot of engineers could spend a lot of time doing studies and feasibility work and it never goes into production, but that, that pit was actually mined and I believe it's completely reclaimed almost by now as well. After with, after with Marston, then went to URS Corporation and worked in their contract mining group. So there I did a lot of it really did functioned in two roles. One was support for the contract mining operations that we had around North America and spent a lot of time in Northern Ontario in a phosphate mine, which was owned by Agrium. And that was a real interesting experience is that the, the rock was terrible. It was basically, they drained a swamp to build the mine. And a lot of the times it was one load of phosphate out and one load of rock in so that the trucks could actually keep driving. So that was a real interesting operation. And then spent a lot of time in Dry Valley, south southeast Idaho, Soda Springs, working in a couple of phosphate mines there. Uh, we also had a lignite mine in Germany, which I really wanted to visit, but never had the opportunity to, where they ran the big bucket wheels and really missed, I really wanted to get that experience, but, but never got to. After about uh, four and a half years through those jobs, I took the PE exam and passed. I took that on a Friday uh, and I started with resource capital funds on Monday and have, haven't done any engineering work since. I always say I'm one of the least qualified professional engineers there are and that I bet, met the bare minimum requirements and, and moved out of engineering. But uh, then spent 11 years with resource capital funds, which is a private equity fund investing exclusively in the mining industry. And, you know, started as an analyst doing financial modeling and due diligence up to the point where when I left RCF last year, was managing about a $500 million portfolio of investments across, uh, you know, around the globe and all different kinds of commodities. And through an investment there is really why I ended up with McGriff. And I'll talk about that as I get more into the talk, but we ended up having a massive insurance claim that I spent two years of my life working on and working closely with McGriff and then ended up now working with McGriff and their mining group here in Denver. Um, McGriff's a large company. I'll touch on that more at the end, owned by an even larger financial conglomerate, but I'm really part of the mining team, which is three or four people out of a company of 50,000 focused on insurance and risk management in the mining industry. So, uh, I wanted to touch a bit on, you know, some of the volunteering and giving back that I've done. I think it's really important and some things I've enjoyed more than just about anything else that I've done in my career. Most of it's been through SME, but through some other industry organizations as well. Uh, 
I, here at while I was a student was was involved in the student chapter. I, I think that's right that I was gem chair and treasurer. I I'm pretty sure I couldn't recall exactly, but you know within that I served in the Colorado section board for a number of years. I think the student sections are much better now about actually being involved in, in the Colorado section. I'm pretty sure when I was a student, I didn't know that that even existed. So with that, you know, I, I think I held every position was on the board for 11 years, including chair for three years. And I think it's changed a bit, but when I did it, it was more like who, who, who wanted to put their hand up. There wasn't much of an election process. So it's good to see, I think the board and Heather, I don't know if you're still on there, but it, it's grown a little bit to where there, there's, more desire to serve the goals. Within SME itself, again, served on a number of different committees, young leaders. I think, and I'm sure that, I know Heather again is, is on that, if anyone else is, uh, including the chair. Back then though, I think there was about 20 or 30 members in young leaders versus the hundred and some there are today. Uh, again, I was out, uh, awarded the Outstanding Young Professional Award by the M&E Division as well, along with, I said, serving some some national committees. So I always like to not try not to brag with that, but I think it's important and really get a lot of value out of doing those things and, and giving back. So. Hey, Justin, yeah. I know the value that SME gets for, for people like you volunteering. What do you get out of the first? I guess the simple answer is I enjoy it. I don't know if that's what I get out of it, but I like going to the conferences. I like going to the meetings. Um, got to know a lot of different people doing that. Selfishly, now in a business development role, there's a lot of good contacts out of that. You <laughs> get to meet new people, but I don't know. It's, it's something I've always liked doing, no matter what organization I've been a part of. I've always liked to volunteer and be in leadership roles within those those different positions, societies. Yeah. Have you always had support from your employer to be spending time on this organization? Yeah, yeah. They've covered every dollar I've ever incurred in travel. Yeah, it, it, I don't know. I just kind of submitted on my expense report and moved forward. I mean, especially now, it's being again being in business development now, it's, it's highly supported. But now, RCF, URS, Marston were all great in terms of attending conferences and paying dues. I mean, it's what three, four hundred bucks in, for the, the membership, and especially the conferences in Denver every other year. So, you know, attending that is it's relatively small. So. I think one of my, my first boss early on too, you know, she's like, well, the people you meet with today, your friends, they're not in leadership roles now, but they will be at some point. So you know, I think a lot of companies do see the value and that it's more not, not, not paying for today, I'm paying for down the road. I have taken, you know, technical sessions and things like that as well for continuing education credits. I, I do hear every once in a while companies that aren't supportive and that, that personally, I'm always shocked by that. And like, I don't want to say I wouldn't want to be part of a company that, that used that way, but I think it's pretty self-centered. And what is the cost for me to be an SME chair? A couple thousand bucks, maybe, for some travel hotels and membership in the grand scheme of things. It's pretty insignificant. Right? <laughs> yeah. How do I make this? If I make it full, there we go. That's better. One other thing. But I was joined a little while ago to the World Mining Congress, which was created 40 or 50 years ago. And it's actually part of the UN to help bring Western mining technology to the kind of the former Soviet, Soviet bloc. And that's been really interesting as well. It's, it's an interesting organization, but definitely the travel side of it's been interesting too. Um, they put on a my, World Mining Congress every roughly three to four years. That's been adjusted a bit, obviously, as everything has over the last few years. But I was able to go to the World Mining Congress in Kazakhstan as part of that place. I never thought I'd have a chance to visit. Um, I think the next World Mining Congress is in uh, Brisbane in next summer, I believe it is, actually. And every country that's part of the World Mining Congress has three delegates that are on effectively what's the board of that organization. So um, I'm one of the three U.S. delegates to be part of that. So talking about insurance. Now, I think the important thing is, is why, do, why do we care about insurance? I think 
it's never an exciting topic. I don't think anybody gets excited when their insurance broker gives them a call and wants to talk about something. But at the end of the day, it's an incredibly important part of risk management. And I think that's really what we try to push and sell on the insurance side is yes, we ultimately make money by selling insurance, but how is that comprehensive risk management plan put together? Because to, what do you want to do at the end of the day is you want to take what the risk is yours and give it to somebody else. And that ultimately is what insurance is. So, you know, why should you specifically personally care? I think mining engineers get asked to wear all kinds of different hats. You go out to the mine site, you're taking fluids and statics and thermal and all these other classes that, you know, because you're the one that ultimately gets sucked into doing a lot of those things. And I think a lot of these smaller mines, smaller companies, insurance is going to, insurance and risk management is going to be part of that. You know, safety. We all talk about all the day, engineers, metallurgists, you know, leadership in the mines who are responsible for safety. There's a direct correlation between the cost of insurance and how safe the mine is. And it can be substantial and tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars of premiums can be saved or lost based on how safe your mine is. So uh, safety, obviously human life is the most important thing, but there is a dollar and cents cost to it at the end of the day as well that your employer is obviously going to care about in the dollars. Um, it ultimately protects your assets and most importantly, the company's assets, but in certain roles, it also can protect your assets. Most common is you know, directors and officers of companies can be held personally liable for some things that go wrong. Or if there's unpaid taxes or unpaid salaries, depending on the country you're in, people can have to actually personally go after you and go after your assets. So ensuring that you are personally protected and the company is pr protected is incredibly important. So the last thing I think anybody wants is to you know, have their personal wealth or personal assets taken away from them. So, you know, at the end of the day, kind of simply, you know, what is, what is risk? It's the probability that something will occur. Insurance, by definition, is a transfer of risk. I'm taking the risk that I'm going to pay this, and I'm transferring that to somebody else. And then I think it's in simple terms, what can you insure against? Anything that's defined as a pure risk. So a pure risk is something that has downside only. So you can't go to the roulette wheel and insure your spin because there's upside and downside, but you can't insure against a fire, a flood, uh, earthquake, theft, all those kinds of different things. So when we talk about insurance, I mean, there's millions of different insurance products out there that are, but I, I picked five that I wanted to talk about today that I think are kind of the most prevalent, the most basic and the most common that we see in mining specifically. So property and casualty, that's basically insuring your trucks, shovels, and then liability, somebody breaks their ankle. Executive risk, that's like directors, simply directors and officers and other things. Surety bonding, employee benefits. So that's 401ks, medical, dental, all those things associated with employees. And then political risk insurance, and that's the reason I'm standing here today talking about McGriff, which I'll get to in a, a little bit. So you just mentioned about liability. Yeah. Did you say that transfer of risk is the same as transfer of liability or no? Wait. Financially, I think probably, but maybe not legally. So if somebody slips and falls and breaks their ankle and they sue you, you know, your insurance is going to cover the cost to pay their medical bills, pain and suffering, those kinds of things. But you know you still could be held criminally liable or something like that. You can't transfer away. I don't know. No insurance product is going to insure you against a criminal activity. Yeah, I believe that means lawyers does not understand that. Yeah. So property at the end of the day provides protection against your stock. So it's your house, that's your car, TV, your house. In the mining world, trucks, shovels computers, real property, personal property, all those types of things. But there's other things that comes along with that. Like what happens if your ball mill breaks and you can't run the mine for six months while you're waiting for another one? Or in the world today, you're waiting two years for another one and you've got salaries due next week. You've got payments, royalty payments due and you've got leaseholdings due. 
you can insure against those kinds of things as well. So it's not just the property itself, it's what happens when that property is lost, stolen, and broken. So you, you can you know you can insure your income. What if you're buying explosives from one guy? And that guy goes out of business and it takes you six months to find another guy that will sell you explosives. You can get insurance to help cover your costs while you're transferring those kinds of things. So that's where I think it's more than just, you know, as an engineer to think about more than just, uh, you know, that truck caught on fire, I need a new truck. There's all kinds of other things that are associated with that that can help provide you know, risk management to a, to a mining company. I think if anything, the thing about property insurance is property insurance pays you. So if something happens, you get the money. And then most importantly, loss, the loss must be caused by what's called a named peril. And what is the peril? Well, that's what caused the loss. So that's the fire. That's the flood. That's the earthquake. That's the rock slide. I think we've all obviously all saw what happened in Florida with the hurricane a little while ago. Almost all homeowners insurance exclude floods. You have to buy separate flood insurance. I'm sure you've heard lots of stories of people whose houses, you know, floated away. And if that, you know, that is that is a flood, and that's not covered unless you specifically bought flood insurance. So it's always important when you look at these policies to know what you're covering it against, because you're not covering that truck against anything that happens. You're covering it against. Usually, it's laid out explicitly what it is covering for. And I think, you know, joining this job and learning about it as well, I learned a lot about my own insurance. And I mean, you bring out your own policy, and I probably read it for the first time ever to so understand what exactly are you are you personally insured against. So the casualty insurance is the other side of that. And I mean, I would call it liability insurance. For some reason, the insurance world likes the world casualty. The big difference between property and casualty is casualty pays the other guy. For his property pays you. So that's somebody breaks their ankle. You, you know, that insurance pays him to cover the medical expenses. You know, he sues you for loss of wages, he sues you for whatever it may be. The casualty insurance is causing somebody else or pays somebody else. Yeah, well, the big thing that falls into that is obviously workers' compensation insurance, which is mandated on a state basis that employers must carry it to cover expenses of employees that are injured on the job. And that's really the big factor when I talk about safety. Because because it's such a highly regulated industry and priced, the only thing you can really do to control your cost is how safe or unsafe of an operation you are, office building, whatever it may be. So when workers comp can cost huge amounts of money depending on how many employees you have and what industry they're in. And then I think everybody's heard about umbrella policies as well, but that's really your last line of defense. That's a policy that sits on top of everything else and covers you in that extreme scenarios above and beyond what you're typically covered against. Executive risk. I think a lot of people here in this room want to move up into management roles, leadership roles within companies. And this is what protects the directors and the officers of a company. When you talk about TNO insurance, there's three three aspects to it. And people just talk about it side A, side B, and side C. And in simple terms, you know, side A is the part that protects your personal assets. So you get sued as a director for something you did, somebody thinks you made a bad decision, you didn't disclose something. You know, you you bought stock, you sold stock, you did something you weren't supposed to do, whether you actually did that or you're just accused of it and you get sued personally. The side A coverage is what you're looking for. And typically companies will buy more side A coverage than they will the B and C because they really want to make sure that they're not going to lose anything of their personal wealth, personal value. Uh, B and C cover different sides of the company, but I think the main differentiator I wanted to make is just the A side. If you ever hear side A, that's really protecting your assets. Side B and C is protecting the assets of the company. I mean, errors and omissions, very common in the engineering world. Anybody that does consulting work, doctors, lawyers, insurance brokers, engineers, that's the insurance that you'll need to carry. 
that covers everything from you, know, you design a bridge and it falls down, or the mining world you're signing off on feasibility studies or reserves, any of those kinds of documents. This is what you want to make sure that you have. So if you made a mistake and you get sued over it, you're covered and your insurance company is paying for your loss, not yourself personally. No, it's ultimately pretty cheap insurance to carry to you compared to like the cost of insuring a haul truck. Cyber is relatively, <coughs> excuse me, relatively new and new coverage, but something that the insurance company world has lost many, many dollars over, over the last few years because I don't think they realize the risks and it happens continuously and it can be incredibly expensive. So cyber covers the costs of somebody hacks your system. I want five Bitcoin or else I'm not giving you your data back. I think we're all obviously seeing that more and more in the world today. You used to be able to buy cyber for like a thousand bucks. Now it can go anywhere from thousand bucks to millions of dollars to I'm not going to even provide it to you. It's just the insurance world is based on probabilities of something happening. There's been actuaries for hundreds of years calculating the probability that something happens. This hasn't been around long enough and the insurance world can't figure out how to price it appropriately. I don't, there, there doesn't seem to be any statistical analysis behind how often a company gets hacked, why this company versus another, what's riskier, what's less riskier. So if you even do get cyber coverage these days, they're going to mandate certain protocols, multi-factor authentication. It's interesting. It's probably the one technology we're going backwards. Some companies are requiring physical backups. I feel like we all went to the cloud and now the insurance companies are saying, well, if you want coverage, better have everything on a table drive so that you can get back to work the next day. Uh, you know, crime is crime, stuff gets stolen. Uh, then employment practice liabilities, you know, again, you get sued for sexual harassment, age discrimination, all those kinds of things, protecting you as the leadership of the company. And I think a lot of things, these are protecting you, whether it's true or not, it covers the legal fees to defend you along with the settlement. So even if you are wrongfully accused, you know, there can be huge costs and lawyers in legal fees to make, to defend yourself and all of these provide coverage for those types of expenses as well. So, uh, there's there's hundreds of different kinds of surety bonds, but anybody have an idea where surety bonds really play into the mining world? Reclamation. So you've got a project, it's gonna cost, you know, they, got, they do their estimate and says, it's going to cost ten million dollars to reclaim this mine when you're done. I want ten. I want ten million dollars in cash in the bank to make sure that if you walk away from it, I can still reclaim this property. Now, that's really not a great use of capital is to raise ten million dollars and give it to somebody else for twenty years while they just hold it. <laughs> Especially for mining companies, where the cost of capital is ridiculous. So I mean, you know, in my greatest illustration here. You know, the mining company can give the cash to the government where they can sit on it. Or what you see a lot of times is what's called a surety bond is put in place where a surety company, an insurance company, provides a letter of credit to the government that says, you know, in a default scenario, I will provide you the money to put this in place. And the insurance company doesn't have to actually put that cash up. They just have to put up the letter of credit. But these are like companies like Zurich and Chubb, AAA rated credit agencies, which the government views as good as cash at the end of the day. And then instead of putting up that $10 million, you know, you pay a fee. So it's, it's somewhat like a loan, but instead of actually money transferring, it's just a letter of credit. So you could pay, you know, three, four, five, 10%, whatever your, based on your credit per year to the surety company to have that letter of credit in place in your name instead. Because the big thing here is this is an irrevocable letter of credit, which means it never can go away until the mine is reclaimed. So once the surety makes that obligation, you know, they could be stuck with that for 100 years if that mine lasts for that long. And sometimes, most of the time, there will be collateral as well. It's, the surety company rarely takes 100% of the risk. They'll say, I'll put up 50% in the letter of credit, but I want 50% in cash. But still, 50%. 
of 10 million in a bank account is better than 100% of 10 million in a bank account. There's other things too, like uh, performance bonds. Let's say a contractor says they're going to do work. You can actually ask them to post a bond so that if they go bankrupt or they fail, you can draw on that bond to, to finish your project. So there's a lot of ways to use. While surety falls into the insurance world, it's much more of a financial instrument than it is necessarily an insurance product. I mean, we do a lot of work in employee benefits as well. Insurance help you help companies set up 401ks, medical, dental, all, all of the fun things that we live with is, that, that employers provide these days. So. Not something I deal with, but you know, obviously something important that insurance provides. So political risk insurance and, and why I work for McGriff today. I worked for RCF. RCF made an investment in a project in Armenia. And it was funded by RCF Orion at the time to build a gold mine. And it was about $500 million project. It was financed by RCF, Orion, Caterpillar, uh, an export credit agency out of Sweden. And right when RCF was making this investment, it was when um, Russia annexed Crimea, very relevant today, and kind of had the view that he might not stop with Crimea and might be interested in other former Soviet entities. So at the end of the day, RCF looked at a political risk insurance policy to cover the investment that was made there. So the mine was 70% complete. There was ultimately a revolution in the country. And the mine was shut down by the government, by local protesters, by all kinds of different entities. And we ended up suing. We filed a claim under the policy, which was denied, saying it wasn't covered. And we ended up suing them and spent two years fighting them over the, the uh, payment under that policy and ultimately was successful. Learned far more about Armenian politics, <laughs> insurance, those kinds of things than I ever thought I would. But McGriff was the broker who sold RC at the policy and you know, kind of why I ended up in key insurance work today. So, it, you know, I can cover a lot of different things, though, like not only just having your mind taken away from you, but things like if the government institutes law that don't allow you to export your, your commodity. I think you see those lots of or OK, you, you mine and you have to sell your gold to the local the local um, bank. And they pay you in pesos. One, you can't export that if you can't export that money. Or two, they say no, you can't. You know, you can't change that into dollars. You're stuck keeping this in pesos. So there's a lot of things politically that you can insure against that might not be considered, you know, mainstream mainstream insurance product. But, uh, I think the important thing on political risk insurance, though, is it has to be selected at you. So if the government institutes a 25% royalty across the entire country, that sucks, but they are a government. They are legally allowed to tax business and citizens within their country. If they give you a 25% royalty and nobody else, that's illegal. And that's where the coverages like this can come into. So it has to be a selective act against your project. It can't be something that governments are you know, legally or entitled to do as long as they do that to everyone equally and fairly. That was a very interesting experience to be involved with for like I think it took over two years to get a claim. Justin, can I go back to that one for a minute? No one talks about this, but it's there with kidnap and ransom policies. Does that fall under this? How does that is it drifting that? How does that how's that done? I know they exist, no one talks about them. I wouldn't lump that under a political risk policy. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to find anybody a policy, but I wouldn't lump that as political risk. I think it's different. Political risk is more covering dollars than people. Or and most political risk historically has been equipment. So who does can have the grants insurance? Well, I'm sure all the large insurance companies would do it, 
I mean, that, that dovetails well into my next slide of why you hire a broker. <laughs> <laughs> because the broker's job is to go find you that insurance. Uh, I, I don't know, like, I could look into that who actually provides it. I'm thinking control risks and those kind of organizations, organizations probably do that. Yeah. Well, they, I don't think they would provide the insurance, though. Mm -hmm. I doubt it. I, I don't, I don't think they're in that. Yes, you don't know. This way. Yes. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, I've not sold a kid up in a ransom <laughs> policy. <laughs> you don't want to have to use it. <laughs> no. I mean, I, like, I know RCF had those and it was part of a travel policy and I don't think they're actually that expensive you know we had Paul's you know I think if you're traveling to a lot of those interesting countries you know you have medical evac type insurance right um, yeah you know kidnap and ransom bribery those kinds of things uh, to get out I mean they really all that insurance does is you want to get out of there you either want to get home safe or you want to go to a hospital with western medicine and that that's what that insurance would cover so you know, if you're in Africa, you want to get to the Middle East or South Africa or Europe and you know, wherever it may be and, and get, be in a better place. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what does an insurance broker do? You know, our job is to sit down with the management team and look at all of the risks that are facing the company and figure out what risks you want to keep and what risks you want to try to get rid of. And those risks that you want to keep, how do we best manage and reduce those risks? And really, I think where an insurance broker makes their money is, you know, I've talked about all these different products and no, no, no management team really is going to have an expert that understands it all. And it's really an insurance broker to make sure to sit down and say, okay, here's everything that you need to cover you. And I'm going to put together a program for you to do that. So it's really building all of the parts together, but then also building the individual parts because most Policies will have multiple carriers on them when it gets to big dollar values. And bigger companies will carry hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of insurance. And one com one insurance company is going to take on all that risk themselves. So you'll get these stacks where you know, insurance company A covers the first 20 million, and then B covers the next 20 million, and C covers the next 5 million, and D covers the next 10 million, and you build these stacks. And that's what the broker does, just taking all of these separate policies and putting together the package that makes sense and is appropriate for the company itself. So we'll go out and talk to Chubb, Zurich, Travelers, Skyward, get all these quotes together. Like, right, we, we talked to everybody. This is the most cost-effective way to do it, to build the coverage that you need from you know, all of the different lines of insurance that I just covered. And you know, I think the important thing is the companies don't pay the brokers. The insurance companies actually pay the broker. So to work with an ins to work with a broker is I don't want to say it's no cost to the company because obviously the premiums are higher because they're paying the broker themselves. Sorry, the insurance company's paying the broker back. There's no cost to you to go out and talk to a broker, ask questions. You know, they work the work the broker works for the company, not for the insurance company. So, you know, really at the end of the day, we want to make sure that, you know, you're not paying, you're not overcovered and there's no holes. So a bit about McGriff. I mean, McGriff's been around for a hundred years, plus or minus, depending on, they sometimes count it differently. We're part of Truist, which is a large financial conglomerate, 65 billion market cap company doing all kinds of things for retail banking, insurance. I don't know if you ever heard of BB, bb and or SunTrust, but all these different financial, I just call it a financial conglomerate, basically at the end of the day. Um, 3,500, out of the 3,500 people that work for McGriff, there's, like I said, there's four or five of us that are in the mining world, but we are people that know the mining industry and understand it well. So in addition to mining, I mean, McGriff's big enough that they will, will do insurance and, and anything you really could care about at pretty much every industry there. We have somebody that's an expert in. And, you know, Denver, I was like this because like, we're like an island. And somehow we're part of the Southeast region, which <laughs> not sure how that works, but 
Yeah. So the big thing that insurance companies will look at is what they call loss runs. So send us a list of every claim you've made over the last three years, five years. They got a distinction there though, is we're the broker. So we're the middleman. We're not determining cost. We're not determining the rate. We're out there to find you the best rate. It's up to the underwriter at the end of the day, he's the one that calculates that. Uh, for like workers comp, it's called a modification factor. And these insurance companies pay actuaries to sit in the background and do all kinds of big statistical analysis over industry data versus your personal performance data. So you know, what things like MSHA citations, OSHA citations, injuries, as your building burned down five of the last six years, things like that are going to obviously lead to higher rates. Clean records, you're going to lead to lower rates. Um, you know, I, these companies don't disclose how they're calculating, what their secret sauce is. So, yeah, that was it. So, thank you. Happy to take questions. Problems with insurance is typically when the claim is filed, they're trying to buy you back. Yeah. And they point to all the fine prints. How do you essentially prepare for that? Uh, I think that's where a broker really earns their money is the broker works for you at the end of the day and your broker should be helping you, defending you and working with you to make sure that claim's appropriately paid out. It's important on the front end, as I talked about, you know, named perils along with other things that you actually you make sure you understand what's included, what's excluded. But I mean, not to make it a sales pitch for McGriff, but you know, we have lawyers and former insurance underwriters and adjusters that work for us to just specifically help clients to those things so that we can make sure that you know we can put together a package to ensure that you get paid what you're entitled to. The other thing too, and it's not very scientific, but a big broker and large brokers can apply leverage to be like, look, we do billion dollars of business with you each year. This is a million dollar claim, like you're gonna pay this. And <laughs> business does get done like that sometimes too at the end of the day. So it can be having a broker that has leverage to be able to call the most senior guy and just pay, you know, get this done. It can get done. I mean, in reality, again, there are a lot of exceptions to parallel management. I mean, uh, for someone who looks for insurance, possibly you know what type of parallel they're going to run into, right? That it's not excluded. I've done, uh, I have this um, earth and emissions. My God, I read through them, speak it's Greek, I have no idea what the hell it means. Yeah, I mean, you sh that's, you should ask your broker those questions. I mean, that's why they're getting paid, is to explain it to you in English and not legalese. Oh, but it's very pages. That's whatever country you're in, all the rest of that stuff. So, yeah, it's, you know, that uh, kind of what I said when you go back to it is like the main, I think the main job of the broker at least is to make sure there isn't holes. And sure, you're not gonna insure against every risk, but you want to measure what's covered and you don't, you want to know too, like things like declaring reserves are obviously riskier than a mine plan and make sure you're covered for those kinds of things. I think, you know, the example I you always like, I think that I like to make is when there's a flood and all of a sudden somebody's house burns to the ground. Do you know why that happens sometimes? Yeah, it's you land on fire because you're not worried about flooding. Exactly. Flood insurance is excluded from most policies, fires aren't. So people try to, like, no, my house is flood and burned to the ground. I'm covered. Or at least my personal property inside the house is covered. So it's always, you know, I don't want to say it doesn't happen a lot. But I think that's a classic example of, oh, yeah, well, the fire got into the electrical panel and it caught on fire and it burned my house. Again. 
So trying to weave their way into something that's covered under the policy versus something that's not. Question. For the lifetime of a project, uh, from the really early exploration stages all the way to acquisition, permitting, feasibility study, construction, operation, and closure, where when is the first time these uh, insurance brokers gets involved in a brand new project? Very <laughs> beginning. Uh, I've been before. I've been there before in the in the PDAC in Canada, and honestly, from comments from the junior uh, exploration companies, they don't have the money to pay for the insurance. I, we run into that a lot. I think it depends where you are. If I was in the US, there's no way I'd do it. We're a litigious society. Somebody walks onto your land and breaks their ankle, you're going to get sued. I mean, it just, it's what if a driller drops, you know, what if the driller's truck falls over on the property, dumps a tank of diesel fuel? You can take those risks, but, in, you know, in Canada or West Africa, maybe. The U.S. No way. Would you drive without car insurance? <laughs> it's just a, I know a lot of poor, like poor students, don't have a lot of money, but you're not going to give up your car insurance. So, now, an exploration company's basic insurance 30, 40 grand a year. Not nothing, but it's not millions. Is it close to what hold? Also, the drill. <laughs> I know every geologist that runs the company has that exact same thought. But uh, you know, then things like workers' comp, though, in the U.S., like you, you, you don't have a choice. You're buying it, or you're going to be in jail. So yeah, like there are there are other examples where it's there's no option. If you're in a less litigious society, maybe not. I do know one company that's publicly listed in Canada that doesn't have TNO insurance. I think they're stupid, but their view is if we do everything right, uh, we'll, we're not going to get sued. In Canada, I think it's less risky if you, if you were US listed. I mean, that's just, you're just asking to lose your house. Yeah. You will get sued. Shit, sued by your own shares. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, like if a junior DNO coverage in Canada is probably 10 grand, they list in New York, it's 100. I mean, that's the difference in how litigious the US is versus Canada. So that's big. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, do you have that type of insurance, like the opposite one? For example, if the project success, then you have to pay. If it fails, then it is already insured. Because in exploration, there is a very high percentage that they won't find a deposit. So the lower percentage is to find. Yeah. So the insurance becomes the opposite. If they find, then you pay them. If not, like a reverse up. mortgage. I don't know. That would be great if it worked that way, but it does work. I mean, going going back to my comment about pure risk, like exploration is not a pure risk yeah. because there's upside. So you, yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're getting at, but <laughs> and that happened before, like in 2008. You know, one of the codes was such type of insurance that some loans would be failing. They ensure that these loans are failing. If the loan success that they pay, if they fail them, they get the money. So mm -hmm. This is yeah. that's why uh, the idea came to my mind. And in my like, in exploration, there are some such similar. That's not the norm. You might be able to, I mean, I've never heard of that. No, no, insurance is very highly regulated. So like you have to be licensed to sell it. The companies that issue it have to be admitted. They have to do all. You're never going to get a reputable insurer to do that. You might be able to get, you could write your own contract with somebody to go that route, but <laughs> Chubb or Zurich's never going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What about situations that insure, you know, as you know, the big problems that you, your regulators come in and will give you a number for your surety yeah. for what you have to be insured for or cash bonds, right? The problem comes in if your insurance carrier comes up with a different number for a given site to students. 
I mean, or you're involved in litigation between the state agency and the insurance company. Who pays for obviously the company ends up paying for that, but how do you get that result? Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of these. I think everybody agreed in the mining industry that the government's calculations are double what it's going to actually write off. Exactly. And I think they do that purely from a risk perspective to make sure that they have enough money on hand. And I think that's why if I was a surety provider, I'd have very little concern writing a bond for you if I take 50% collateral. Because I'm pretty confident that even if everything does go wrong, I'm going to burn your cash and very little of mine. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it, whatever the government, I mean, you're, you're arguing with the government at the end of the day, I don't think the surety provider would really ever dictate the, the cost. Or they, they're probably going to calculate their own cost, but I don't should actually share it with you. Yeah. They, they probably want to make sure that your numbers are right. But I mean, I know, I think we, you know, for like these smaller projects, right? There's an Excel sheet, how many acres, how many feet of road, and how many whatever, and it spits out a number at the end. It, you know, it's 10 grand for a size the size of the classroom. And, you know, you go out there with a bulldozer in the afternoon and draw some scene, you're done. But you know, the government says it's 10 grand. But I, I think I think Sheree is misunderstood a lot too. And, and the US is way ahead of others. Like I, I was surprised like, just and being in Vancouver and Toronto talking to people about Sheree and how many very sophisticated people don't know that it exists because it's historically been such a US thing. Like there's even like I know a project the Northwest Territory, but like Northwest Territories just won't take it. They don't they won't take a surety bond. They don't understand it. I'm, I'm not doing that. It's like, oh, I understand cash is cash, but like a letter of credit from a triple A rated company is pretty darn close. And if these major insurers are defaulting on their debt, I mean the, the economy is in a really bad spot. But it's been abused for a long time, you know, collateral. Backing has been abused for a while. Yeah, I think mean, you saw the coal mine in Wyoming, right? Where all of these, all of like um, Cod Peak, Arch, Peabody, they were all self insuring their bonds in the state of Wyoming. It's like, well, you're, you have great credit. I have no concerns. Well, then they had $4 billion of debt each. The market cap was 100 million bucks. They had no money. And then all of a sudden, the state of Wyoming says, we need to post some cash. <laughs> well, they don't have any money. No one would give them credit because they didn't have any credit. So, like, I've always struggled with that. And like, yeah, the self-insured, well, being the state, looking at the state side, it's always great when the mining company's got good credit. Oh, I have no concern. But then when you want the collateral posted because the company's credit is terrible, you know, you kind of need to do that before things go bad. And I mean, you know, every company in Wyoming went through bankruptcy and they're all still operating. So it really wasn't a big deal at the end of the day, but it was all those mines shut. I mean, that Wyoming could be stuck with big issues. If I was a regulator, I don't usually side with regulators, but I don't think I'd allow self insurance on sure you want to call out a reclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Is your document form going to have it? And if you don't have the form, there are any other documents.